is yeah. Okay, so just once again, uh, welcome everyone to the introduction to conferral judging by the WSDC 2022 CAP. Uh, we are here to provide a brief overview of conferral judging and the documents that we have released. And at the end of this session, we plan to have a brief amount of time which we dedicate to different scenarios and questions that you from the community have in order to further develop the documents that we are uh, making, but also to promote the conferral process. So here, just specifically, I would like to introduce uh, Maurice and Eric, which are who are primarily in charge of the session. I feel that both of them need no introduction as they're very valued members of the community, but also have been very helpful and have worked very hard on these conferral documents and Maurice in the working group at the WSDC uh, board as well. And with that, I would just hand it off to Maurice. Okay, um, I assume I can still be heard. Um, so, the way this is going to work is that I'm going to start off by explaining comparatively um, how exactly it is that the conferral system will differ to um, the previous years insofar as the process of judging and what happens in the room as soon as the round ends is concerned. Uh, and then we'll move on to specifically how judges should interact within that framework, which is what Eric will do. So. Um, firstly, um, let's just do a brief overview of what exactly the previous process looked like um, in order to then compare and contrast uh, with conferral judging process. So, as you probably know, what would happen in the previous years and the previous system would be that you would arrive at a verdict by yourself. Um, then you would do your speaker points and fill in your ballots independently. Then you would share, like the chair would share what the decision was um between the different uh between the panel uh, and then basically what you would end up with is a brief discussion with the chair um for the reasons as to why you came to that decision and um the the different things and information that you'd like to be included in the oa then you would get the oa delivery um oa oral education the, the reason for decision for the round um uh, and then at the end you would deliver individual feedback to the speakers um which is like if asked um, now, what happens with conferral? Um, next slide. Okay, cool. Um, so, the first part, which is that you will need to arrive at the preliminary verdict, is different because now it's preliminary, it's not binding. You have to come up with your different preferences, like the different information in the round, evaluate them, weigh them among, like within yourself, uh, and then come up with a preliminary verdict, some leanings insofar as the round is concerned and some brief reasons for your decision up until that point. This is not binding insofar as you do not need to fill in a ballot independently as you would um, in the past, because then you are going to engage in the conferral, uh, which is going to be done by the entire panel. Um, the first part is going to take you five minutes. Uh, we expect the conferral to take you somewhere between 14 and 20 minutes. Uh, by the way, these are just estimates and guidelines as to how we would envision this is going to work um and obviously different panels might do less than that um hopefully not more than those times that we've given you um then you would end up doing the uh discussion with the rest of the panel where you would do the conferral um where you would ask the questions you have come up with your initial leanings talk about the different clashes that you identified within the round and have a chat regarding the round. Um, the, the very specific bits as to what constitutes conferral is going to be clarified a bit later as to the guidelines of judging a conferral uh, by Eric. Then after that discussion, you will do you will take three to four minutes, hopefully, uh, to fill your ballots independently. This doesn't change. What changes the fact is the timing, which is after a discussion happens. Then you will go back um, after filling the ballots have a chat insofar as the OA is concerned. You can, again, give feedback to the chair about things that you really want there uh, to be included in the oral education or things that were particularly important or just the, the chair wants some time to structure their thoughts and everything. Um, and then, uh, which we will expect to take approximately five minutes and then you will get the OA delivery, eight minutes um, by the chair or the panelists from a majority, like, even if the chair splits and is in the minority, that doesn't necessarily mean that, you know, a majority panelists will have to do that. This happens after some type of um, discussion among the panel um, and for serious reasons, such as not being able to um, 
deliver the, 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 the call that you didn't agree with. Uh, and then you do the individual feedback, which is going to be done by yourself, very similar to the way that it's been done in the previous years as well. So that last part, the, the last couples of this, uh, the, the last steps don't really change. Um, overall, the entire process should not take more than an hour. Um, this is something that obviously, like the, the, the timings within, and I repeat that within that one hour can change depending on the structure of the chair, depending on the type of the round, depending on the panel being unanimous, agreeing and everything, dancing kumbaya all around together, but like sometimes it will not be like that. Sometimes, well, this is something that is very subjective and very round dependent. So this is just a guideline that um, is telling you that this whole thing should not take you more than an hour, ideally. Um, so these are the differences structurally insofar as um, the, uh, yeah, j just uh, insofar as the judging process is concerned. Um, so um, what do we mean when we say that you arrived to your preliminary verdicts uh, and what do we expect to do within the five minutes we've allocated to that? Um, firstly, we obviously have to track the debate closely through good notes and identify issues as they emerge in the debate. This doesn't change, presumably independent of any judging style. Um, you have to do those things um, and uh, come up with the responses to what it, who wins the big clashes in the rounds and how you weigh them in particular. So, um, so, so, so for instance, uh, th this will have to do with the big questions of the round. So for example, in this half of alcohol, is this a legitimate choice? Uh, does it reduce the harms? What are the impacts? These are the types of things that the big questions that you would like to engage with within your uh, preliminary verdict discussion among yourself. Um, then you will generally try and see um, how things interacted within the round uh, and who you think won the round based on those things that you've identified, either me, the main key clashes. So this will happen by comparing the contributions of the two teams on the specific clashes or uh, um, the, the, the biggest issue in the round and who you think that the, which team you think won that one issue. Um, all, all those different things that you take into account when deciding uh, why a single team wins the debate. These are the types of things that you will have to do when it comes to arriving to your preliminary verdicts. Um, Additionally, it's important to actually clarify for yourself what it is that um, you consider to be the biggest issue in the round. Um, the reason why is because of the fact that when it comes to the actual conferral, as we'll discuss um, further a bit later, um, there needs to be an understanding among the panel insofar as what the big questions are, because if everyone has very different big issues or people have not identified the big issues in the round, then the discussion will become a lot messier than it should be. Uh, and then considering all the all that stuff, you're determining a winner, um, which is how you arrive to your preliminary verdict. So um, generally, this process remains the same. The timing is the biggest difference um, because of the fact that you will have to go into do different things, but also because of the fact that some parts of the process have changed, i.e. you do not have to independently do the ballot. Now you don't have to do the speaker points, um, et cetera. Um, then what you do is what's the next slide you can fare with a panel so that's the juicy part the reason why you all are here today um this is supposed to take uh, 14 to 20 minutes approximately um again this is not binding so what are the different types of things that we expect people to do when comparing with a panel the first issue that the, the first type of the first type of like questions that are going to be answered within conferral are mostly going to be things in regards to clarifications. Um, we identify two key clarification types of clarifications. The first one being clarifications around the WSDC rules. So for example, what it is that you credit or for example, whether or not a certain strategic choice by a team was a legitimate one, such as a team opposition running a counter model in a preferred motion things that generally have to do directly with WSDC rules, whether or not something is allowed to happen in the round. Um, these are the types of clarifications that we expect, um, the first bunch of clarifications that we expect to be uh, discussed. Secondly, it's about more subjective elements of the debate round. So things such as what happened here, um, uh, what was that second mechanism between X and Y, uh, because I missed that, uh, or perhaps, um, um, did anyone else get the analysis for that point? Um, be because, for example, I was, it was hard for me to follow at that particular point in time um, within the speech. 
Um, or then it also has to do with things such as given that you um, get all the information from the round uh, and that you are very clear about the WSTC rules and what the team said, things such as how specifically you weigh those things, you weigh certain arguments or how to evaluate them, um, which is particularly important for close rounds, um, is something that will be part of the clarifications about the more subjective elements of the debate round that will happen. Uh, that will be uh, part of your conferral discussion. Um, so that's the clarification speed. Um, the second one will be um, trying to identify the issues as a panel. That, so what I mentioned before, the reason why it's important while you know getting to your own verdict to identify big issues and big clashes in the round is because it will generally make not only the conferral process a bit easier, but also a bit more structured and, uh, and perhaps um, the call more um, informed. Um, so the chairs will facilitate the discussion um, to um, head towards, to, to be directed towards the big issues in the round. Um, so for instance, they, they will do the, uh, they will mention that, for example, these were important things, the important questions or issues in the round. Some people within the panel might want to add, or some people might disagree with the importance of a certain clash. These are all things that will be part of the conferral that people can uh, discuss within the conferral discussion. Uh, and, and then uh, we will also discuss this, I think, in one of the scenarios later, later uh, but there can also be discussions in regards to the quality of the round or how tight the round was, um, which can then um, give some information to the panel or create a discussion, mini discussion within the panel regarding vaguely what they felt the quality of the round was. Um, then hinting at perhaps speaker points. So for instance, um, you wouldn't, you, you would get a better estimate than you would uh, in the status quo. So not the status quo. Last year, so for instance, you wouldn't end up, you might still end up with a 65 and a 75 for the same speaker in a round, but it's less likely that that happens if people are able to kind of hint at the, how they watch the round and how they evaluate the different things within it. Uh, at the same time, it's entirely subjective, so this might not even change outcome-wise, but this is something that will and, and can be part of this process. Um, uh, lastly, um, what you end up doing is that you take into account all the information you were given during that discussion, be that in the form of clarifications or weighing or different issues that you might not have considered as important before, uh, and you can change your verdict um, and basically go in and fill the ballot different to the one than you would based on your initial leanings. Um, so summary of this is that, there is a summary for this one, right? I'm sure there was. Where's the bit that goes in the middle of the slide? Isn't there one? <laughs> That's my there summary bit. slide now. Okay, sorry, I couldn't see it. So we are not wedded to the outcome of this decision. Uh, we only care about uh, judges having access to the information and the perspectives to independently arrive at this decision. Um, this is not consensus, which is why vaguely what you, and this will be stressed further into the later slides. The point of this isn't to uh, persuade people to do to, to vote for whatever you think is correct in the round, but rather for everyone to get enough information to independently make the choices um, in the most informed manner for the round. Um, next slide is when Eric takes over, right? Yeah, I'm going to take it over. Yeah. Thank you so much, Maurice. Uh, so now that we understand what essentially the overarching views of control judging is, just going to go through a couple of quick guidelines as well as summing up this portion. So the first and probably one of the most important things with this new model of judging is that you are open-minded during the discussions. So the whole entire purpose of this is for judges to acquire more information from other members of the panel so they can make the most informed decision when casting their ballot. So there need not be any worry with regards to being persuaded or with regards to perhaps it reflecting poorly on you if you change from an initial call. Judges judge from the perspective of the average intelligent voter. Average intelligent voters are allowed, are able to be persuaded by new information. And so allow yourself to be informed, uh, to be persuaded and informed. Uh, even though we don't have to reach consensus, if you are given new information that changes how you view the debate, that is perfectly justified and is central to the process of conferral. Uh, the second thing is when we are having the discussion, which Maurice just outlined, 
you probably want to be specific in your questions. So if you have anything that you are unclear about, the opportunity or rather confer presents an opportunity for you to seek clarity. It's not an opportunity for you to rehash or replay the debate, which is why it's again important for you to have tracked the debate and followed um, the typical judging process that you'll probably be accustomed to at this point. The idea behind conferral is for you to seek specific clarity on specific issues in the round. So for instance, instead of asking vague open-ended questions like what was the second argument of this speaker, you would probably want to say, here's my take on the speaker. I got two layers of analysis. Was there perhaps a third that I missed? That's a very specific question that can give the other members of the panel like the amount of clarity that you want as opposed to it being an open-ended big question, which often sometimes lead to rehashing of the debate and just makes the tournament run over schedule because then your deliberation takes too long. The third thing to be mindful of is the language with which you speak during these uh, conferral discussions. The idea here is no single judge has the authority to speak from a position that says this is an objective fact, i.e. this team won, i.e. there is no way this analysis or this refutation was persuasive enough. You want to give your own take and present your views as opposed to trying to speak from an objective authoritative um, perspective. Again, you are not trying to bully other judges or coerce other judges into coming up to the same decision that you have. You want to explain your reasoning for the round. And as such, there is no reason for you to use language which hinders discussion, rather use language which facilitates the discussion and is probing as opposed to exclusive of certain uh, points of views of the round. The next thing is, again, given the time pressure of the conferral judging process, you'd want to spend time on the most important issues of the round and the issues that individuals um, believe tips the way in which the debate is awarded. So spend the vast majority of your time on clarifying the most important clashes in the debate and the areas of greatest contention or greatest dissent so that you are able to resolve this or, or uh, allowed uh, or rather are able to spend a vast majority of time on this such that other peripheral clashes don't necessarily overwhelm or sidetrack the discussion. Essentially, if judges agree broadly on something being a marginal issue, for example, or something being a wash, you don't want to belabor that discussion. You want to briefly sum that up and move on to the more contentious and issues that are vital in terms of uh, deciding the eventual winner of the round. And the final thing with regards to just the guidelines of the conferral process is to avoid having consistent back and forth. Again, this is a conferral discussion and not a consensus discussion. So with consensus, you have to submit identical ballots and you have to come to the same call. Thus, maybe that will be reasons why you might feel the, it, the urge to want to re-explain your point and perhaps experience some sort of frustration if other judges do not agree with you. With conferral, it is diff the aim is different from that. So what you want to focus on is expressing your views and giving the reasons of for why you sort of debate the way that you did at, rather than trying to get everyone to agree with your own decision. And so as much as possible, avoid having consistent back and forth or falling into arguments within the panel itself. Re receive the information from the other panelists and also share your information on all your view on the round and use all of these as the, as the basis upon which you're able to come to an individual decision. There is no purpose for like long, ex long and prolonged exchanges between members of the panel. Okay. So I, very quickly, an interjection from me here, which is that um, we'll share this, this PowerPoint uh, with everyone, and this will be nested within the larger debater and judge briefing as well. So at the bottom, I've just linked the more detailed conferral guidelines document that you can just click on. And in the upcoming sections, we don't go into great detail on things like speaker scoring, because that's in the debater and judge briefing. Um, yeah. Yeah, thank you so much for that. Uh, okay. And then at this point in your deliberation of the debate, you would have finished your conferral discussion. You now move on to the segment towards uh, submitting your own individual ballots. Similar to previous years, ballot submission is still independent. What has changed is of course the time at which you are um, submitting your ballots. So you will still fill in your ballots independently and based on the information that you've gotten from the panel discussion during the conferral time, you assign scores and you uh, would evaluate who you think wins the debate, either sticking to your initial decision 
or flipping to a different decision if that is the outcome of the conferral process for you. Here, you are still going to use the same WSCC criteria of content style and strategy. Try to not think of these as distinct categories or discrete categories, but rather things that work well together to enhance the persuasiveness of the speech and help you assess whether or not this the, whether or not this speech was of a high quality, a, an average quality, or a below average quality. So whilst we, you still have to score according to each of these categories, they oftentimes do uh, enable one another and form a holistic picture of how you should be like uh, evaluating the individual speakers. The thing to note about ballots again is that, oh, sorry, just one final thing uh, before, I'm not gonna go into the range and stuff because that will be in the briefing, but the speaker score that you assign are a mathematical representation or a numerical representation of your view of the debate, i.e. if you think this was a good debate, you probably want to give these scores on the uh, WSCC scale that corresponds to that. And, and there has to be a correlation between your assessment of the round from the clashes and from how close you thought it was, as Maurice has previously uh, outlined, to the numerical value that you ascribe to individual speakers. This is not to say that if the debate was a high quality round, everyone should get like exceptionally high scores uh, because there's degrees of subjectivity there. But generally, if this is an above average round, it is unlikely that you'd have significantly below average scores. So just being mindful of the correlation between your numerical representation of the speeches as well as your assessment of the debate. Um, yeah, not gonna go into the speaking scores. Those are attached in the briefing that just will have access to at this point. Okay, can I go up to the next slide. Okay, after ballots have been submitted, the panel discloses to the chair what was their final decision. So did they remain with their initial decision or did they change their decision? And then now we get into preparation for the oral adjudication or the reason for decision, uh, whichever terminology you are most familiar with. Here, only one person of the panel has to give this OA and it has to be reflective of the opinions and views from the entirety of the panel. Most of the times this will be delivered by the chair judge uh, but in instances where there is a split and the chair is in a the minority, they are free to ask someone in the majority to relay the oral adjudication. This is not compulsory. You can be in the minority as a chair and you can still opt to uh, deliver the OA if you feel comfortable doing so. But if you feel uncomfortable, then you are also free to ask a member of the panel who is in the majority to relay that. You want to have a brief period of time, so five minutes to prepare this oral adjudication. And here you, again, just take note, as you already should have throughout the whole conferral process of the views of the other judges, but you also want to request from the panel any key points of divergence or anything that they, anything that they think is important for you to articulate in your oral adjudication that you may have missed. Again, the OA has to be reflective of the entire panel's views, okay? And then finally, we come to the delivery of the oral adjudication itself. Again, only one member of the panel, typically the chair or someone from the majority in the instance of the split. With regards to delivering the oral adjudication, you want to cap it at around eight minutes. Sometimes it may go a bit longer if it's a particularly close debate, but like do not go into 11, 12 minutes. Try to keep it short and straight to the point as much as possible. Eight minutes is a good time and a sufficient time for you to relay an OA. The speakers have to convince you for eight minutes. You can also convince them of the decision within eight minutes. So when it comes to delivering the oral adjudication, first and foremost, please do deliver the results. So either on a unanimous decision or on a split decision, this team won. There's no need to be suspenseful. It oftentimes also means that the children do not listen as much to your OA because they are focused on wanting to hear the result as opposed to um, your reasoning. So get the result out of the way such that you are able to have the maximum attention from the, from the debaters. Keeping your OA within eight minutes is crucial also for just the logistics of the tournament and you do not reveal any speaker scores. Uh, speaker scores are delivered at other points. So you do not as a chair reveal speaker scores linked to this. You also are not obliged to reveal who was the best speaker of the debate. Um, there is no need to do that. Focus on the holistic view of the debate and justifying who wins or who wins and why they win and why the other team loses. In, within these eight minutes, you want to walk teams through the tracking of the debate, as well as show them the way in which judges evaluated the interactions 
um, between the hashes of the round, rather than it being a rehashing or a replay of the debate, you want to synthesize clashes, for example, or specific issues that make it important that were important for the panel in terms of uh, deciding the winner. So, for instance, what are the specific issues or clashes that be, uh, that were important in the particular in the debate, and why did the judge the panel view them as important? Uh, were these issues equally important or were other issues more important than others and giving a reason for why this is the case. Either it might be based on the burdens from the motion or the amount of time teams prioritize and the level of interaction within a particular clash. You want to express this to the teams as well so that they can get a better picture of a better picture of how the panel received the debate. And then you also want to then just by uh, which team won on these specific issues and why they did that. Importantly, within doing this, you want to be comparative. So don't just list out the arguments that were given by one team and then say there were other arguments by the other team, but this team won. You want to point out specifically what on what basis and on what grounds were, was one team more persuasive than the other. And you also want to explain the strengths and weaknesses of the teams in the manner that is always comparative and tracks the evolution of these clashes because debates are oftentimes progressive. So you also want to note how refutations and rebuilding played out in terms of the assessment of that clash. Importantly here, you want to be balanced in your view of both teams. Do not be overly critical of the one team and do not be do not praise the other team uh, like an absurd amount or, or disproportionately so. You have to you want to balance both the positive and constructive criticisms for both teams. And typically the way it plays out is that it's very rare that you have teams winning by a landslide. There's always going to be some mitigation that was provided. So you probably also want to point out the kinds of responses that were given by the other side, even if they lost, and why you found them to not necessarily be strong enough to tip the clash, but still pointing out that there was a uh, and pointing out that there were responses and reflecting how the debate played out. Finally, when you're done explaining the decision, um, or rather when you are explaining the decision, focus only on the work material that was presented by the teams. If you have any points of constructive criticism and how you think teams could have improved on their cases, save that for the later end when you are giving constructive feedback. And that's it on the oral adjudications. Okay. We also recognize that we have judges who have spent other years or just time in different circuits with different formats. And oftentimes that leads to some confusion or conflation across formats, and that's not always smooth. So you can have good judges that are excellent in one particular format and are excellent judges when it comes to evaluating debates, but perhaps would struggle with the uh, WSCC format specifically or with the conferral judging specifically. And this is just a table that compares and contrasts the different formats and also the different ways of judging to conferral judging in order to show you how we are to come across, uh, sorry, how to come up with the decisions and the differences between those process. So on the first area, we have the timing and the purpose of the discussion. So in a format like Asian parliamentary, where it is individual ballots uh, independently and judges independently arrive to, the, to their decision, there is a very low uh, importance to a discussion. So ballots are just submitted by individual judges and there is a brief discussion almost as, as means of a formality or, or just ceremoniously, and it doesn't really affect the outcome of the debate. With independent ballots, so um, in previous WCC editions, for example, or in Austral's uh, formats, here there was medium importance to this. So after ballots are submitted, there will be a discussion order for the person who is reflecting the decision of the panel to incorporate all of those aspects within their oral adjudication. In consensus judging, which is like in the British parliamentary format, there's a high importance to the discussion given that it is a consensus decision and you have to submit identical ballots as a panel, you probably have a lot, you probably take a lot more time in order to hash out these disagreements and reach that consensus. With conferral judging, which is what is being adopted at this year's edition of WSDC, there is a medium importance to it, which is why it takes about eight to, sorry, 12 to 18 minutes as more research put it out. And you have this discussion before you submit your ballots in order to expand the information that members of the panel have at their discretion to come up 
with their individual uh, decisions. So there is a medium weighing to medium to high weighing of the to the discussion, and it's a very vital part of the comparison system. Second thing is on the importance of that discussion. Again, in Asian parliamentary, it's likely to be low. Uh, also because teams directly score the judges, given that all judges have to present their own oral adjudication, um, there is really no reason for that discussion to occur. With independent ballot systems, it's the discussion is of medium importance because it only matters to the extent to which it enriches the oral adjudication. In a consensus uh, format, it's of course of a high importance given that this is the primary method of evaluating who won the debate and the panel has to broadly attempt to reach a um, consensus on that. With conferral, again, it is between medium to, it has a medium to high importance because the discussion increases information that judges do have and thus can also influence their eventual decision and the outcome of the debate. This is why it's done prior to the submission of the ballots. But again, it's not the method of evaluating who won the debate because judges are not compelled to have to arrive to a consensus decision. Okay. On the fourth area, with regards to the approach to divergence, in Asian parliamentary system uh, formats, it probably only matters to the teams and not to the judges themselves, because again, the teams are the ones who bear the consequence of that mostly. In independent ballot systems, it matters as much as the person delivering the OA should include dissenting views within clashes. But again, it has a limited amount of importance in terms of that. In consensus, as, yeah, in consensus decisions such as BP, if you have divergent calls, it probably triggers a longer and more in-depth discussion because you have to resolve these divergences and try to convince one another to, towards your initial call and give reasons for why that is the case. Within conferral, the importance, or sorry, the way we do approach divergent views is so that the room acknowledges and appreciates the alternative ways that exist of viewing the debate. They oftentimes isn't just like a single correct way of viewing around. And also the explanations that these judges give can again influence the decisions that judges have to eventually arrive at independently when casting their uh, ballot. So it might affect whether or not they change their decision. With regards to the likelihood of dissents, it's relatively high in AP formats, relatively high in independent ballot formats like previous editions of WSDC, given again that there's no discussion. In consensus, relatively low because you spend a lot of time trying to arrive to a decision. You only really vote if there is a time pressure from like the org com and that sort of thing. With conferral judging, it is important to note here that it is unclear, right? With conferral judging, we are agnostic as to the reasons that individuals eventually arrive to. What matters is the process. So the final decision, as mentioned previously, is something that we are not wedded to. Uh, and therefore, the likelihood of dissent is unclear in conferral judging. And the final thing with regards to the number of OAs, in AP formats, we have a separate OA from each of the members of, of the panel. So you can get like up to three oral adjudications. With independent systems, one OA, consensus, one OA, and also with conferral, a singular OA presented either by the chair or one of the panelists in one of the judges in the majority. Okay. And then the final part to discuss would be offering constructive feedback to teams. This will take uh, about the last quarter, and quarter of an hour to 20 minutes uh, from the overall hour that Maurice had pointed out at the top of this presentation. When you're giving constructive feedback to teams, here you put on a different hat. You are not the unbiased judge, you are taking on more of the role of an educator who is trying to help uh, debaters improve in their skills. So essentially here, you want to provide suggestions for how you could have perhaps approached the motion differently, or how the teams could have approached the motion differently, how you would have approached the re refutations in the round or specific arguments that you could have run in, this, um, in, in the debate that has just ended. This is useful, but again, it's not necessarily a necessity on your part, given that teams have coaches for the most part, and also therefore they cannot expect this from you, but it's useful if you are able to at least elucidate on how you would have uh, approached the debate as a judge, um, as a judge, presumably with more experience than the teams speaking. 
Secondly, you can also suggest to teams how to prioritize their material, perhaps in instances where there were difficulty with crediting an argument, but argument was not fully fleshed out because it came out later in their team's, in their team's constructive material. You can probably point out that this something needs to be highlighted more or used more as a more central part of your framing, so on and so forth. The other thing that you do when providing constructive feedback is you just want to provide more in-depth feedback per speaker. So again, trying to be balanced in, with this. So what did they do well? What can they improve on? Do not be overly critical on one individual member of the team and also do not be overly like praising of one individual member of the team. Try to balance both. It's very unlikely that you get a brilliant, a absolutely and completely brilliant speech. Also very unlikely that you get an absolutely and totally um, horrible speech. So balance those perspectives. Adjust your feedback to the speakers. Uh, read the pitch of the room. Do not overwhelm novices. Do not perhaps be uh, too simplistic to perhaps more experienced individuals. Try to pitch your feedback at a level that's appropriate to the caliber of the speakers you are speaking to. And also do not single out an individual on the team, as I've already mentioned. And importantly, you also want to be open and receptive to answering questions. So if a team wants to ask for further justification on how you weigh the particular exchange, be open and willing to do that. Okay, thank you. And just to re-emphasize that, the process of judging in the conferral system, you first start first five minutes independently arrive at a preliminary verdict. So this has a debate into important clashes or exchanges that you think should decide the outcome of the round. Then spend the next uh, 14 to 20 minutes together as a panel, engaging in the conferral discussion so that individuals can get more information and, and be exposed to perhaps alternate views of the debate. At the end of this, individuals should make their own final decisions again. And then for the next three to four minutes, independently fill out your ballot and submit your ballot. Once your ballot is in, you can reveal your final call to the chair, uh, and then, the, then we will know the final verdict of that debate. Did proposition win or did the opposition win? After that, we go into the uh, we go into the portion where you prepare for the oral adjudication. This is led and facilitated by the chair or a panelist in the in the majority. Um, if the chair is uncomfortable delivering the oral adjudication the entire panel has to support this process, okay? And then with the OA delivery, only one OA, either by the chair or the panelists in the majority. And then lastly, with individual feedback for, sorry, with yeah, individual feedback for the teams, 15 to 20 minutes. This is again done independently, but ideally all judges are available to give feedback to all of the teams so that everyone can learn from the debate that just happened. The entire process from you starting your deliberation to giving feedback should ideally not take more than an hour, but again, situations do occur uh, where you either can go slightly below that or slightly above that, but do try to be thorough. Yeah, and this is, a, I think at this point, we will open up for questions. I do see there are already some questions or comments in the chat. Yeah, I'm just gonna stop, just like pause our screen share. Uh, just to do questions. So I'm stopping that, stopping that. So I think we have already two questions from Mark Gabriel. So the first one, uh, whether it is a requirement to reveal your preliminary verdict during the conferral discussion, or is it okay to keep that to yourself? Uh, and here it is a strong encouragement. So based on the WSDC rules that were adopted, this is not required by the rules themselves. However, this is our strong encouragement as the CA team, as we believe that it will facilitate the discussion and increase the speed with which uh, conferral happens. So in the need to keep inside the time, but also to help make the discussion clear, we do ask the chairs to ask for the preliminary decision and for the panelists to give it as well. Uh, and I just oh, wanted to quickly okay. add to that that the reason we have a strong preference in favor for it is also for judges to hold themselves accountable and actually make a preliminary decision. And so that if there is a split at the start, we can quickly identify points of divergence and spend time on those. Or if you know that it's unanimous at the start, um, just to answer your second question, um, and you're on the same page, which you realize if you are unanimous, and people know that and start the discussion that you can keep it quite short then.
Also, we have a third question as well. If there are shadow judges, are they involved in the control judging discussion? Um, sorry, so did we respond point... the second one? The second question? Yes, yes, I did that, but very briefly. So, Maurice, we just want to um, answer oh. that again. Yeah. No, like my, my only thing would be that it, there has to be a balance because you might agree on the initial call with all the other judges, but there might be someone that actually you have to do the process and walk through all the steps because you might all end up being on the wrong page altogether. Or, or someone might understand that, you know, just have to do the legwork and maybe not go to the extreme, but, you know, do the work. So, um, just. Sure. Sorry, go ahead, Eric. Didn't mean to interrupt you Just there. On that again, the other thing is you want to also know the divergence of that of the call. So, was it a close debate? Or was it like miles ahead for one of the other judges on the panel? These are all things that you want to account for. So the discussion is still valuable, even if initially unanimous. Yeah, that was just it. Uh, just to the question on whether a trainee judge is involved in the confederate decision making. So the answer is yes. A trainee judge is involved in the confederal decision making, but does not submit a ballot. Um, we understand that this might increase the time a little bit, but we will not place more than one trainee a room in cases where we do have a number of trainees. And we've built in buffers into that one hour that gives chairs the opportunity to direct some pointed questions across the panel so that everyone gets the opportunity to contribute. Um, and increase the amount of information overall. So if there are any additional questions, now would be the time for it. You can either write them down in chat or just unmute yourself and ask the question. We are aware that this is a new procedure, so any questions would be more than welcome to facilitate the development of the entire control process for WSDC. And of course, the door is not closed if you don't have a question now. If you think up of one later, you can always uh, drop us an email. Um, would it perhaps be more efficient for us to go through the scenarios we've prepared so that we don't have to repeat them afterwards if these questions exist, plus give everyone more time for questions? Yes. So. Yeah, Just to can... answer the Benjamin's question, yes, trainees are included in the discussion. However, they do not fill out the ballot and they cannot vote uh, as to who won the specific round. Um, okay, I'm hoping people can see my slide share again. We've just got a couple of scenarios that we wanted to discuss with you um, on the next slide. So I'm just going to move to that uh, if that works. Um, Eric, Luke, and Maurice. Yeah. That's good. Yeah. Oh, I should have animated this to come one by one, but that's okay. Sorry. It's no problem. Yeah. So these are just some potential scenarios that we do foresee can occur during the process of judging. And we just like to perhaps provide initial clarity on how they could be approached. So the first scenario is during the initial uh, part of conferral when you are tracking clashes, the other two judges seem to have a response written down that you did not have as a judge yourself. Should you now factor this into your response, i.e. you missed a part or you did not think your response was given? In brief, the answer to this is yes. That is the aim of the comparo system for you to expand your knowledge or your in the amount of information that you have from the debate in order to cast a final verdict. So if there is new information that is being exposed to you that with authority was actually st stated by the speakers, you have to factor that into your overall um, de decision for the debate. Yes, I don't know if anyone wants to add anything to this or if we move into the second scenario. Uh, yes, so I would just add here is that you get the information from the other judges and this is additional information that we want you to take into account. However, you as an individual judge can also choose not to do so. So it is up to you in the end to decide whether or not this was clear enough for the teams. So it is perfectly acceptable for you as a judge to say, I understand that the other two judges understood this line of analysis. However, for me, it was the team's responsibility in making it clear. So we want you to be mindful of this additional new information 
this does not necessarily force you to agree with everything that the other adjudicators uh, in the room say. So you are responsible for your own decision in the end, and you should holistically weigh the entire debate and see whether or not some responses were clear enough for you as a specific judge. Yeah. Okay. The second scenario, you are a chair and you have just asked the wind to track an issue. You, you realize that you do not compare contributions, but instead keep listing arguments teams ran. What will your response be? Um, ideally here, you want to politely interject and ask if they could compare as opposed to rehashing the debate. Because again, the purpose of conferral is not to repeat the debate or to replay the arguments of the debate, but it's to assess and evaluate the ways in which the teams engage with each other's material and which team would come out on top as a consequence of that. And so because of that, you probably do not want to have judges spend a long period of time not necessarily being comparative, but instead merely being reiterative of the play-by-play -play in the round. Dane, if I don't want to add anything here. I just wanted to add that there might be the unfortunate circumstance where you make a polite interjection or you give an example and the person that's judging continues to do that. I think in that situation, we just have to accept that there are cases where judges are judging differently and there isn't a lot we can do uh, to force the issue at hand um, and sort of not do anything after that point rather than constantly try to get them to do something even if that's taking more time. Yeah. So yes, it is, it is an annoying case of the answers to all these questions is that it depends. That is very true. Hey, the third scenario, the debate has ended and you are the chair. You enter the conferral discussion and think opposition has won the round extremely clearly. When initial verdicts are shared, there is a split decision with one vote judge voting for the proposition. You realize halfway through discussion that the decision will likely remain unchanged, i.e. a split, even at the end of all judges clarifying their questions and hearing out the tracking of the issues. What do you do as a chair? Um, in short, again, you do nothing. You continue on with the process because the purpose of conferral is not to get everyone to be on the same page and have the same read of the debate. It is instead to expose everyone to potentially alternative views or readings of the debate. So there is nothing that you can do as a chair. You have to let each individual member of the panel submit their ballot. And if the decision remains a split, even after the discussion of conferral, it remains a split after the conferral discussion. Okay, again, if anyone wants to chip in, feel free at any point. If not, I'm going to proceed. The fourth scenario, a judge during conferral explains that they missed parts of speech, uh, yeah, parts of speeches because their internet had dropped off. They say they will not fill their ballot, but will participate in the conferral for experience. What will you do? Here, you, there is a disconnection policy. So if the judge has indeed disconnected for SIB and as per the disconnection policy was unable to participate in the debate, they do lose their voting rights, i.e. they cannot necessarily vote. Uh, yeah, they cannot vote because they did not fully ex uh, get the, the debate and they did not judge it. The purpose of conferral is to give um, information. And so, oh, okay, yeah. The purpose of conferral is to give judges information and it's not to rehash the debate. So you cannot use the conferral system as a way for you to explain to the judge what was said within the speeches, if they're disconnected such that they cannot vote, uh, such that they cannot, they could not hear the debate, they cannot vote and they cannot also participate in the discussion, in the conferral discussion. So to be clear, they cannot participate in the conferral discussion. They will be listening in on what the other judges have experienced, but they lose their voting rights and cannot, cannot cast a ballot at the end. And just in terms of why we made that decision, the entire point of the system is to Im increase information collectively, which requires you to have the best possible to begin with. That is, you should have listened in on the round and tracked the debate fully. And if that is something you were unable to do and hadn't raised the disconnection policy such that you could go back and listen to the couple of minutes that you missed, you ideally should not be influencing the other people's decision, given that your information is actually quite poor on the round overall. Okay, 
and for the last scenario, you are a chair or panelist, and it becomes quite clear to you that the rest of the panel is not giving the speakers as much credit as they should, and that they are likely to not apply the speaker scale as you would. What would you do in this circumstance? Uh, again, in short, there's nothing that you can do about this. The purpose of conferral is again, not to reach a consensus. So you don't have to have identical ballots. The most you can do is advocate for why you thought it was either a high quality round or a low quality round, but you cannot influence these individual scores that each judge presents at, or submits at the end with their ballot. So all you, the best you can do is advocate during your deliberations why you thought it was a good round, but you cannot coerce or try to persuade the speakers or that the judges allocate to the speakers. So okay. here, just to add, add briefly, as I think this could be one of the questions, and that is to what extent do you discuss speaker scores within the round? So the primary purpose of conferral is to reach a decision as to who wins the round and to provide adjudicators with as much information as possible. Within that, if you have some time to discuss the overall speaker scores within the round, or certain feedback or crucial issues, it is absolutely possible for you as a panel to discuss this. However, do prioritize reaching a decision and talking about the round and the clashes and who won the debate and be mindful of the time you have. So this, keep, just keep in mind to not cause delays with conferral as this is a completely new process as well. And that brings us to the conclusion of at least the presentation. Yeah, I am also aware we have taken the hour we requested from the lot of you. So thank you so, so much for staying with us. And obviously we're here for the next few minutes if you've got questions. Um, but while some of you might be percolating some questions, three quick announcements from us on things to look forward to tonight, because at this point you will be getting emails from the CA team every day, sorry. Um, first is you will get the full debater and judge briefing out tonight. Those of you who are obviously coaches and want to refer to some of that um, while thinking about your cases, working with your teams, that would be useful. And those of you who are judges, please, please read through that very, very carefully. Um, and we would appreciate judges on this call to actually use that to do the judge test because that will make your life and our lives a lot easier. The second thing coming your way is a, a judge training update. So we're doing our judge training, the first one, the upcoming Saturday on the 30th. So you will have a link that you can register onto similar to the one for conferral briefing. And the last is a new nations update, which is just a set of practice debates that we're doing on the 31st Sunday. Um, so we're, we're sending through a link uh, for that as well. So these three things will come through together on an email and go up on Facebook as well. So teams that are, new to WSDC in the last three years or haven't broken at WSDC in the last three years. And then teams that don't fall under these brackets as well can sign on to do those practice debates on the 31st. And we will obviously prioritize um, based on teams that historically or haven't had access to practice debates as much. And if there are spots, we'll obviously hand them over to teams that have had a little bit more experience as well. So those are the three things coming your way. Um, we know there's lots of emails, uh, but please, please bear with us. and do read them. Yes, uh, so the copy of the latest full WSDC rules, notes for adjudicators, definitional guidelines. We have a CA team version of that that's on the debater and judge briefing. That is one of the three things you'll be getting tonight. Uh, and I think that should answer most of those questions. But obviously, if there's something we've missed out, uh, please do drop us a line and we will add that on as well as send out a clarification. Um, will the 30th July meeting be recorded? Yes, 